Chapter 13 is where the book really begins to take off the training wheels. And that has to do with the creation of cylinders and cone objects. Cylinders, as the book presents them, are pretty interesting. They can be infinitely long, uncapped, or capped, and we can even sort of invert them or twist them to create a top and bottom cone pinched together at the center. Things start first with a test meant to simulate whether a cylinder is completely missed by a ray, a pretty easy test to complete. Notice that we don't define a top or a bottom right now. The cylinder is infinite in height. The second test is where things get interesting, and we are attempting to strike the surface of the infinitely tall cylinder. My test fails, and it looks like my math is okay, so I go online and check the errata. It helped me a few times so far, so I figure give it a shot. I notice a submission discussing that the input vector is assumed to be normalized. This is written earlier in the book, but I've apparently forgotten. However, my actual issue is the test itself, because I'm using assert.r equal with doubles, which, due to their imprecision, is a mistake. I switch to using assert.isTrue in my float evaluation method in my utility class, and that makes everything work. Intersections are handled. The second requirement is to be able to calculate the surface normal of a cylinder. This is easy for an infinitely tall cylinder, as its profile when looked at from above is just a circle. Now things get interesting, and we move to a shape that can exist in our world, well, sort of, a cylinder bounded at the top and the bottom, but it's still infinitely thin. Now that I have some experience with negative and positive infinities from the refraction and reflections chapter using doubles, I'm a bit more confident throwing around those terms inside of my code to define the default size of a cylinder. Notice that I'm making sure to normalize those vectors at the start. I'm not going to make that mistake twice. The intersection test has to change now to account for regions above and below the minimum and maximum size. If we strike those surfaces, we know to ignore the intersection. For capped cylinders, we not only test the sides of the cylinder as before, but we'll need to rely on our planar intersection test restricted to the area of the circle created by the cylinder. A Boolean value called isClosed is used to determine if we want to cap off the top and bottom of the cylinder. I really should probably go back and add a separate bool for both the top and the bottom so I can keep one open-ended if I like. Something for the future. Two new methods are added to specifically check the tops of the cap. Check cap performs the test once, while intersect capped will call it twice to do both the top and the bottom. Remember, when we perform our intersection tests, the objects are actually in local space. This is a convenient space, which makes all the calculations a lot easier because typically these objects are of unit size and don't have some crazy rotation, scale, or translation associated with them. 
I made a silly mistake and I forgot to use the size of the list in my comparison. As you've noticed, a lot of the time my mistakes are pretty stupid. The end cap normals are next and are really easy. They either point straight up or straight down on the cylinder in local space. The point being assessed must first be transformed from world to local coordinates. This is something I have to do in each method, so it's a good idea in the future to move it to some other part of my parent class ray object so that I never actually have to do this every time I create a new class. Once again though, that's a future thought. Hmm, test didn't pass. Oh, there's the culprit. I forgot to delete the minus sign, which means I was negating the epsilon value. Now it's gonna work. All right, serious business time. The book is really starting to hand the reins over to us with the cone object. Gone are the longer explanations of how things work and layers of unit tests moving you closer to the goal. You get the unit test, and maybe some pseudocode. That's it. The first test is a pretty huge one. Straight up intersection with a cone and array. Most of the math gets recycled from the cylinder with some small tweaks. I do struggle a bit, but we'll get to that shortly. I'm taking my time here and implementing the unit tests first for both infinite and capped cones before testing because the book kind of presents the entire thing as a whole, really a retrofit of the cylinder code, and it's just easier to do it all in one shot. As before, a cone has a min and a max value, allowing it to be infinite in height if you'd like. The interesting thing is that if you just want one cone and not the hourglass version presented here, you actually need to specify the top maximum at zero, cutting off the upper half, or putting the minimum at zero to have a flipped cone. The book helps a bit with the normal calculation, stating that the plane part for the caps is the same as the cylinder, just the mathematical tweak for any part that would normally be the walls of the cylinder. I decide to manually copy the code so I understand what is happening as I transition from cylinder to cone. There's a reason why we're only about halfway through this video, and it has to do with a single sentence in this book. Here, I'll read it for you. If A is non-zero, you'll use the same algorithm, but with the new A, B, and C that you used for the cylinders. When I first read this, I misinterpreted it multiple times. Not sure if it's the first part in the new A, B, and C constant values, or the reverse of that, so you're going to get a few moments here of me struggling to figure that out.
Alright, it took me a little while, but we got there. We have cylinders and cones, and what better way to test a cone than with some ice cream? First I set up the scene and add a cone along with some ice cream scoops made out of spheres. I jump online and find the values of some nice pastels for the individual scoops. Now's the finicky part, moving the individual scooped spheres just a little bit in each direction to add some realism while stacking them on top of one another. There's the first render. And the scoops are off, which I expected. I can tweak the camera back a bit and move the scoops closer together and fix all of that. Now we're getting close. We've tested spheres already. Now it's time for the real test, the cone. I set the minimum to zero so that the bottom half is cut off only leaving the top portion of the hourglass shape. I decide to give it a nice alternating pattern, thinking it'll look like a waffle cone. However, because the pattern is moving through 3D space and not the 2D surface of the object, it doesn't quite end up looking the way I want. That would require UV mapping, something the book suggests you can do, but doesn't really discuss. And there we have it, my mathematically described ice cream cone, made with the ray tracer I built from the ground up. But we're not quite at the end of the book yet. Two more chapters await us. Next, grouping objects together, and then finally, triangles. Something I'm much more experienced with. Let me know how you're doing if you're following along. I'll see you all next time. So long and goodbye.